It's fantastic for me to be here. It's really an honor. Thank you, Sachi, and thank you, the Komuni, and AZ, for bringing us all together. I would love to take you all on a journey of exploration where science and art and engineering and design become one to help us solve challenges for humanity and to lift us all up, to lift humanity up, to see what's possible. We make the impossible possible in all of our exploring. The incredible Hubble Space Telescope has been investigating and exploring for the past 26 years. How many in the audience are 26 or younger? All the students raise your hand. Your entire lifetimes we've been searching. And we ask, just as Galileo asked, are we alone in the universe? Are there other habitable planets? And did Mars once have past life? The same enduring questions for all of humanity. And we're starting to get the answers. Hopefully you went with us on a trip and uh, to Pluto. Everyone know about New Horizons? We've been to Pluto. We've explored all throughout the solar system. And you know what I love about Pluto is it has a heart. Pluto has a heart. We had never seen Pluto. We had never been close. But just over a year ago, we zoomed in, and now we know it's a dwarf planet. I still count dwarfs. But in the exploring to what is it made of, what are the chemical compositions and the mountains, and revealing what we've never seen before, but just like Galileo looking up at Mars, we knew it was there, but now we're finding out about what it's made out of. This is an interactive art piece called a gigapan. It's Pluto and it's moon Charon. But if you go onto our website, it's all people's faces. We ask the world, what did you do in July when we, when we humanity, got to Pluto? What were you doing? And everyone sent in from their iPhones and smartphones, the snapshot, and we created this. So you can interact with this art piece. It's a gigapan where science and art and humanity are all just one synonymous event. We have our Dawn spacecraft, and it's just gotten to another dwarf called Ceres. You may have never heard of it. It went on ion propulsion, like you see in movies and science fiction, but at NASA, that's really <laughs> how we get around. So the first ion propulsion spacecraft, Dawn, is today at Ceres, and we've just revealed some new mountains and volcanoes in the universe. It's called a Huna Mons. It's five kilometers high and 20 kilometers wide. And the two eyes, those two sparkling eyes, we didn't know what they were. We had never seen those in the universe. It turns out it's sodium carbonate. It's chemical compositions of what life, perhaps the building blocks of what life is made from. So that's why we explore. We're out in the universe exploring and seeking the answers to these enduring questions about are we alone in the universe. We've been to Jupiter on July 4th. Was in the US, we lit up a whole bunch of fireworks. At NASA, we thought it was because we arrived at Jupiter. On our mission, Juno, the goddess of Jupiter. The goddess is now in orbit, our Juno spacecraft. And we're trying to take the world with us. The image of Jupiter on the bottom right is for the public. It's citizen science, because we're all scientists. And I like to think maybe we're all artists. We're all scientists. The Juno camera is online, and we say, world, where do you want to explore on Jupiter? And you tell us where to point, and we take the pictures. So this is for everyone in the world to take pictures of Jupiter, to come along with these journeys with us. So it's our largest effort yet in citizen science to let everyone explore Jupiter and the universe with us. 
Has anyone heard of exoplanets? Anyone know of exoplanets? A few. Let me tell you, 20 years ago, we didn't know about these. Now it's in complete discipline. Exoplanets, we're searching for Earth-like planets. We've never seen them, but we know that they're there. That's the mystery of science. This is when they pass through, when the exoplanets pass by their sun, we can see a blip. Oh, they were there. Can't see them visually, but we know they were there in the Doppler shift. And so we asked our artists, we've never seen them, but we have the scientific evidence that exoplanets are there. We have thousands and thousands. Today, it's 6,000 exoplanets. 1,000 we put on a catalog for the world to say, help us discover 24 exoplanets, Earth-like planets, seem to be places we want to look for. Could they potentially have life? So our artist came up with these incredible visualizations. The first exoplanet, 51 Pegasus B, we call it. So you could, you could envision it. The artists tell the stories. The artists paint our pictures. Kepler 16b, move over Luke Skywalker, Tatiun, if you're a fan. Yes, Kepler 16b is a binary system. It has two suns. You get two shadows every day. Two sun, it's a, it's a binary planetary system. So as I said, 24 exoplanets, Earth-like planets out there that we didn't know about. Some of them are super Earths, have incredible gravity. PSO, there's no sun, very unique. It doesn't have a sun in its system, a very unique planet. So we're out there exploring, finding as many planets and searching for the answers to our questions. You might have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope. It's miraculous. It's going to be 100 times more powerful than our Hubble telescope. It has 18 articulated mirrors. This is it. It's designed. It's built. It's at NASA now. It will launch in 2018 from French Guiana with the entire European Space Agency on the Ariane 5 to show our collaboration in exploration is always international. It's global. It's the world exploring, just, just as it should be. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to look, first and foremost, into the solar system, into our origins, and look for dark energy and the dark matter that we cannot explain today. And it's 96% of the universe. So we're not satisfied only knowing 4%. This will help us unravel the mysteries of dark energy. Now, I'm taking you to Mars as promised. Yes, it's there.
extraordinary men and women of NASA in our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. I just wanted to call and say congratulations to the entire Mars Science Laboratory team and really all of JPL. You guys should be remarkably proud. So that's the last 50 years of exploring Mars. We are on Mars today. We've been exploring. Now the next incredible challenge is to get humanity there. We will become an interplanetary species. We will have humans on Earth, my favorite planet, Mars number two. But it is our destiny, is our horizon goal to explore and to reach out. It's been a complete honor for me to serve in the Obama administration and speak for NASA and our aspirations, again, to globally explore and get to Mars. We are charged to getting humans to Mars in the 2030s, and I'd like to show you our intentions and our plan. This is a, a three-phase plan to get to Mars. We are currently in phase one, and we're well along our journey in phase one, living and working on the International Space Station for the past 16 years, living and working together and exploring about the astronaut long-term health in space and looking at the technologies that we can demonstrate and think about how we move on from low Earth orbit now into Earth-Moon orbit, getting back to Moon, beyond the Moon into deep space, which we call the proving ground, so we can demonstrate the new technologies we need for Mars. Tell you a little bit more about those. But that's the second phase, the 2020s moving out into deep space. The third phase is when we get to Mars, first in orbit and then with people on the surface. All the same time, our rovers are already there, our orbiters, ExoMars just got to orbit and it's a fantastic success for the Europeans and Russia to get there with NASA supporting and cheering us all on. Today, there are seven assets at Mars. NASA, we have two rovers, the largest Curiosity rover is on Mars, and then there are five orbiters, NASA's orbiters, but also the Indian Space Agency, MOM. I love that acronym. It's the Mars Observer, and now at the ExoMars. So all of those vehicles and orbiters are exploring Mars today again, to do the scientific investigations. Was there past life on Mars? The evidence is mounting. We have seasonal water flow on Mars. This is a new discovery. We knew that there was ice on the polar caps of Mars. When you're searching for life in the universe, we say follow the water. Now we have the evidence for seasonal water on Mars. Huge scientific discovery. It's very high in salinity. You cannot drink it. <laughs> it's the perchlorics are, so it's not something to drink yet, but it's just the first evidence from go, we knew there was ice, now we know that there's seasonal water. We also know how Mars lost its atmosphere. Critical, important. Because in all of our exploring in the universe, First and foremost, it tells us about life here on Earth. It tells us about our humanity on Earth. So how did Mars lose its atmosphere? Mars today has a 1% carbon dioxide atmosphere. Earth, we have a wonderful life support system, our own life support system. We're here enjoying being, living, breathing the nice oxygen in one atmosphere. Well, Earth and Mars are sister planets, 4.5 billion years old each. About 3.5 billion years ago, we think Mars had life. Now, what went so terribly wrong today that Mars only has a 1% atmosphere left and um, you know, we're looking still for the evidence of life? So I'll show you a simulation, which is terabytes of scientific data and a beautiful, beautiful art artistic rendering, I think. So let me show you this. It's the solar winds and solar radiation 
literally ablating the Martian atmosphere away because Mars is not protected by a magnetic, global magnetic shield. Earth, lucky for us, sister planet Earth, and a great place for life because we are protected by a global magnetic shield on Earth, but Mars is not. Mars is not so lucky. That's the solar wind and solar radiation. So to, to me, that's an amazing artistic scientific work, which is just the, the definition of art science in itself. Uh, so beautiful, but uh, from our MAVEN, that's an atmospheric observer, our MAVEN spacecraft taking that data. Again, just a brand new uh, simulation to find out. Without a magnetic shield, it's not protected. The solar wind, the solar radiation, literally ablating the ions, losing uh, Mars's atmosphere in the process. Now, how do we get people to Mars? <laughs> As I said, 50 years of a lot of success with rovers and orbiters, uh, but now we're up for humanity's grand challenge. As I said, it starts phase one, living and working in and on the International Space Station. You've probably heard about Scott Kelly, I hope, and his one-year mission, and uh, with his colleague, Mikhail Kornienkov, they both spent one year on International Space Station, and we're looking at the human physiology and the health and wellness of our astronauts. And we're learning as we go. Uh, there's still more to learn. We will be on International Space Station together with our European colleagues, our Russian colleagues, Japanese colleagues, Canadian colleagues, and 95 different nations, 95 different nations have had, worked with us on International Space Station up in low Earth orbit. So it really is global exploration. And here we see we're living off the Earth, but for the Earth. And um, I, asked, uh, I asked Scott about what technology we need to demonstrate and what we need to work on uh, when he was up there. And here was his answer when I tweeted him. Yeah, I think the uh, life support systems that, that we need to keep us alive in space are uh, ideal candidates for for demonstrations for our future journey to Mars, as well as as well as uh, space spacesuits. We need, I think, new spacesuit technology that uh, you know requires less maintenance uh, in space, and uh, you know something that's going to be easier to work in on the surface under the uh, the Martian gravity. He might, uh, he might have been biased. He might have known that uh, Ellen Stofan and I, the chief scientist, asked him. He might have known I had an interest in spacesuits. But when we look, and again, draw your attention to the international cooperation, all of the member nations that are working together in exploration. And these are just some pictures then of some of the technologies. Now, getting ready for Mars, inflatable habitat type of structures, humans and robots working together, uh, looking at fire, looking at refueling. These are just some of the technologies that today we'll be continuing to investigate till 2024 to help us make that ne next push. We also, from the government and from, from NASA, we are engaged in all kinds of partnerships, very importantly with the private sector. So now, today, we have SpaceX and we have Orbital ATK delivering our cargo up to our astronauts and space station. And coming in the next few years, they will be delivering our astronauts. So it's our commercial cargo and commercial crew. The European and the NASA astronauts in the future will be riding with American companies, SpaceX and Boeing. And so we're making these developments and investments now. It's critically important, we think, for future capability and also the Russians now carry all of the astronauts. Um, 
the 17th. On Thursday, we will have the next launch of uh, American Peggy Whitson with uh, her colleagues, Russian colleagues from, from, from Baikonur, from Kazakhstan. What Paolo is going to, he's there now training, and so we'll hear from that. But the next launch is just in less than one week. So we keep exploring. I guess continually we have astronauts living up on space station off the Earth. And then the Japanese are also um, shown in this slide, uh, delivering cargo to space station. So phase two, what's next? This is when we go back to lunar orbit and um, we are developing what we call our space launch system. So I'd like to show you um, the incredible developments of the world's next heavy lift launch vehicle. We're well under development. The first flight we call Exploration Mission One and we'll launch in 2018. So I'd like to show you a glimpse of space launch system where there's over a thousand American companies and folks working from across the entire US on this project. And the Orion capsule goes on top, which you'll see in the video, and the European support module is linked to the Orion capsule. So the future in the 2020s for exploration is NASA and ESA working together. We're both in the critical path to get our astronauts now into lunar orbit and deep space. Here's what look, the SLS looks like today. That's the next, that's the next version. And I like to say it's always about the people. It's always about the people and the success and those smiling, those, those accomplishments. And there's a lot of failure that leads up to those accomplishments and we try and try and try again and try to, try to get it right. So I have an infographic here. I showed you the video of Mars, the last 50 years of exploring Mars, but I only showed you the successes. <laughs> Um, it's hard. It's really far away. And we have to persevere. So this is the world's history of trying and attempting to get to Mars in all of human history. From former Soviet Union to NASA, color-coded. When you see the red X, we didn't make it. But we didn't give up. We kept trying. We were betting always on the next generation of, of students and engineers and scientists and the artists and designers. But look at the green now. In the last 20 years, we've been sending our orbiters there. We've been landing, we've been successful. And when we say anyone succeeds, we all succeed. We are all in this together. I mentioned the Indian observer, MOM. It uses NASA's deep space network, our navigation, to get in orbit. Just now, the, Exo, the ExoMars series. Again, we're all in this, and we celebrate 
all of the incredible success. And the little lander was a demonstration technology lander. It, didn't, it crashed into the Martian surface. We've imaged it, but that's okay. That's not a failure. What that is is we learn, and now ExoMars 2020, We'll have an orbiter and a lander again. We just keep going. We keep going because every, every success we have is a success for humanity. We have a lot to learn when we get to Mars. These are some of my, my favorite technologies that we don't know how to do today. So we're working on those. So some of these are listed. In the video, you saw the capsule coming in with a lot of fire on it. That's called entry, descent, and landing on another planet like Mars. Today, we know how to land one metric ton with our rovers, cranes and airbags, and we've tried to land every which way possible. But for a human mission, 10 to 20 metric tons. We don't know how to do that. We're trying to find out, we're testing now. How do we live off of the land? All successful exploration in humanity is when people learned how to live off the land. They didn't carry everything with them. So the challenge to all the designers out there is, I know we have some industrial design students with us, the maker, we actually have a maker bot up on space station, which is fantastic. But for Mars, you have to make the maker. It really is a self-replicating mission. You have to make the maker out of the Martian basalt. So that's quite a challenge. So all of these technologies we look at that are the real technologies we're working on today, but that we need for a successful human Mars exploration. And then the point is that from the model on International Space Station, working with everyone around the world, that's the exact model, but we're gonna enhance it. We're asking everyone to join this mission, this exploration to Mars. Our Mars 2020 is the next big rover coming up, and I've just highlighted a few of the European instruments on it, scientific instruments to go with this. And then we have something called the um, Global Exploration Roadmap, and you can see behind me, it's again asking the world, the world's space agencies, let's do this together, let's, let's do it globally. NASA and the US, we'd, we'd love to, to lead, we have the plan, but it's global exploration, not for one nation, not for one space agency, it's for all of us to achieve this together. So I wanna come back down now to Spaceship Earth, um, my favorite planet. What you're looking at is an image from our Discover mission. Our Discover mission is halfway in between Earth and the Sun. It's a very special point. It's called the Lagrangian point. Lagrangian point one, we call it L1. It's completely gravity neutral. So this mission is literally hanging out, literally hanging out without gravity in between Earth and Sun. What is it? It's a space weather buoy. It's a space weather buoy. The solar wind, the solar radiation is coming from the Sun and this is we still have 1.6 um, million kilometers to Earth. It's saying, hey, Earth, here's what's coming your way. And every month, of course, the moon is orbiting, and we get to see the far side of the moon. Not the dark side. Pink Floyd got it wrong, but it really is the far side of the moon. So you can download this app and see this beautiful, beautiful uh, image of Earth, because every day we're using uh, our Discover mission. Now, we have 20 Earth orb orbiting satellites. There goes Space Station over. Hi. Um, 20 Earth orbiting satellites today, so we can, again, we're off the Earth, but for the Earth, so we can image Earth for climate and temperature and sea level rise. What is happening to our planet Earth, spaceship Earth, is critically, critically important. If there's a natural disaster, an earthquake, um, fires, we can take all of our orbital assets and try to give the world real-time data from all of our satellites and images to help humanity, help people on the Earth. That's how we use our Earth sciences and our Earth data. And I'm gonna show you a century of climate data. We've been taking data records for the last 138 years. And um, you can raise your hand when you're born. It's audience participation time in my talk. What you're seeing is color, a color map. One to two degrees blue is below the average. Yellow and orange are one to two degrees Celsius above the recorded. There, thank you for playing. Okay, now the students, there we go. So your entire lifetimes, you've lived at one to two degrees above. 2015 was the hottest year ever recorded in our recorded history. 2014, first broke the records. 
2015. We have the data from 2016 through October. The last 12 months have each month recorded an all-time record. We have an exponential curve. So guess what my prediction is for 2016? It's on our watch. This is just the data. <laughs> this is urgent. It's an urgent challenge for all of us to think about this. So how do I think we're going to solve these urgent challenges for humanity? I think it's with the next generation. I think it's with all the students here with us today and um, mentioned uh, that STEM, I'm very proud to be in the Obama administration and try to raise up science and technology and engineering and math, but um, that's not all it is. To me, I actually call it steamed. I always bring in the arts. I always have brought in the arts. And uh, let's see if this goes forward. <laughs> there go. Okay, thank you. Um, so to me, back to Galileo, back to the Renaissance, if we're really at our best, if we want to solve the world's biggest challenges, then we always bring in the artists and have the visionaries and have the storytellers all the way to the historians. And now I put D on the end. First, I'm a little steamed. Yep, I'm ticked off. We're not making progress more quickly. It's urgent. Second, steamed for the designers, the 3D makers. There's a new generation of designers and makers. If they don't see themselves as an aerospace engineer like me, that's OK. If they don't see themselves as a scientist, that's OK. But I want to make sure that they get the message. I'm changing the message that we need to everyone. We need all the artists. We need the designers with the technologists. And together, if we look at it more holistically, I think, across all these disciplines, then we'll be able to really achieve our goals and uh, raise all of our knowledge and potential. So I really do look at it as all of us working together across these disciplines, if we're at our very best. I want to give a shout out to all the artists here in the audience, all the aspiring artists, because NASA has always uh, been inspired and worked with uh, the artists for the last 50 years. You might recognize uh, a Rauschenberg. You can shout out if you know the artist. We'll do some more audience participation time. Rockwell, you might know. Hopefully Jameson. Maybe a Warhol. These are the artists that have always been with us. So again, the art science connection. For us, this is science, but to me it's the most beautiful, natural, solar system, nuclear reacting going on. This is our sun, and it kind of doesn't get more beautiful than that. That solar flare you just saw is much larger than our entire Earth. Entire spaceship Earth could fit into that solar flare you just saw. So this science and scene is uh, what I call thermonuclear art also puts us in perspective. Our entire spaceship Earth, every living being that we know, our families and friends, fit within one of those solar sun explosions. So it kind of gives us perspective. And I want to, again, just a shout out to Alan Bean. Nicole is with us, and coming up soon, you're going to hear from a, a real artist, astronaut, coming up. But our own astronauts have given us incredible visions. They're the ones who have been there. This is Alan Bean's work. He's been on the moon. So incredible that he's come, then he came back from the moon to, to share only like he could his unique experiences with the world, what it was like to be off the planet and come back home. You're going to hear from, I won't take all of Nicole's thunder, but it's just such a pleasure for, for me to have Nicole here. You're going to hear um, in Nicole's own words about being an astronaut, being an, being an artist. And we always see the Earth as art, and, and this is actually one of our publications. Again, uh, I can't tell you where the science ends and the art starts, uh, because they're synonymous. They're together. These are scientific images from Earth orbit on Earth, but I think they're the most beautiful art. Anyone know where that is in the world? That's in Russia. 
This is in China. This is in the United States. Africa is seen from space. This is where I'll be in a couple weeks in the, the Ross Ice Shield in Antarctica. Anyone? Anyone from South America? This is uh, Peru. This is the Nazca lines as seen in orbit from Earth. So again, history and people and humanity and, you know, seen as this beautiful, beautiful images. We have so many beautiful images from, from space and from space station. Just go through a, you know, selfie. You can do selfies in space here if you're in the suit. <laughs> probably seen this, I'll pause in this image for a minute just to see the Earth's atmosphere, our life support system, that fine line. If we take Earth and put it, shrink it down to the size of a, of a soccer ball, a football, our life support system is going to be three human hairs, three, three human hairs thick on an Earth shrunk down to the size of the football. So again, our place in the world and how precious and fragile this spaceship Earth is. Incredible photography from astronaut Don Pettit. I think this is incredible artwork from his images while on his uh, space station mission. And uh, then recently from Scott Kelly. To me, this looks just like a Rothko. Well, he tweeted this. I was so excited to come into work and see this. Looked like a Rothko from International Space Station. And then I want to celebrate and, and make an incredible point. I don't know how many of you know uh, about Katherine Johnson. At 98 years old, she just received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. These are the heroines, these are the heroes from NASA, our African-American women who, after World War II, were our computers. Computers originally were people. And at NASA, they were the women who were doing the calculations, the orbital calculations, to get our space station going. And so it was the women, Katherine Johnson and her colleagues, who did the mathematical calculations for Al Shepard and John Glenn and then our Apollo astronauts. There's a new book out called Hidden Figures because they were hidden. And we're now writing her story instead of history. Her story is coming out, and we're telling the story about our amazing women uh, that helped really do the fundamental mathematics and calculations to get uh, us into orbit. And so, and the movie is coming out in January, again, called Hidden Figures with incredible actors. So I'm going to leave it there in, in homage and a celebration to all those who have gone uh, before us, uh, embracing the arts with science, engineering, and design. And uh, leave you with something I learned uh, recently from Star Trek since we celebrated 50 years and uh, Gene Roddenberry. How we get there as humanity and how we raise up human potential, I do believe, is with infinite diversity in infinite combinations. And so it takes all of us to, to get there. So thank you so much for your attention and uh, Boots on Mars by 2030.